First, I apologize for my appearance. I am running the sawmill in between breaks, so I'm going to be filthy. Um, it's not really work to run a sawmill in a sports coach. It doesn't work out too well. So I apologize for that. Uh, I am going to talk about kind of an outlook for Alabama timber markets. I'm not going to be able to tell you what's going to happen because no one knows what's going to happen, but I, I will be able to tell you, kind of tell a story of what's happened over the last decade or so, what's kind of driven that change, and then look at some indicators to pay attention for as we go forward and how you know those indicators are going to play a big role in what those markets do. Okay. I'm going to start out by going over a, little, a few facts about Alabama, uh, forestry in Alabama in general, to start out with, kind of the state of the industry. I'm going to use some stumpage trends to kind of tell a story of what's happened over time. I'm not going to go into everything in detail, uh, but I'm going to use some of the primary ones, such as salt timber and pulpwood, to kind of show what's happened over the last decade and kind of what we're uh, kind of headed towards. Um, I'll get to that uh, when I get to those figures. I'll explain it more. But they are overall averages. They're going to be they're going to vary widely. They're just trends over the last 10 years or so. So it's nothing that's going to be quite relatable to in, any individual landowner, but just overall averages. Uh, and then I want to end by talking a little bit about some mill updates that most of you are probably aware of, and, and kind of the role that's going to have in the future in Alabama. So our total land area in Alabama is over 30 million acres, it's 32.4 to be exact. And of that land area, 23.1 of that, or just over 70% of our total land area, is forested in the state of Alabama. And of that forested land, about 98, 99% of it is productive timberland. Of the timberland in the state, it's primarily private owned, about 94% or so. In the lower 48 states, we rank third in timberland acreage, and we rank second in private timberland acreage. In total acreage, we're behind Georgia and Oregon, and private timberland, we're just behind Georgia. We also lead the nation in Lobby pine growing stock, and this was at the end of 2017, where this number was from, but it surpassed the 500 million ton mark in the state. Of that timberland, the breakdown is pretty uniform between softwood and hardwoods. Uh, we make softwoods make up a little bit, most of the majority, about 45 percent or so. Hardwoods, 42 uh, percent, and then a mix make up the remaining 13 percent. Uh, the figure here. This figure right here just kind of breaks it down into different uh, forest categories and timber types. And the largest in the state is your Bob Holly short leaf pine, and then followed by your oak uh, hickory. In terms of timber production and looking at the industry as a whole, uh, it's a $21.4 billion industry that includes both timber production and processing in the state. It's a very healthy industry. It produces over or close to 42,000 jobs a year. Our current jobs directly related to that industry. Uh, we rank second for pulp and paper production in the United States. And we rank sixth for lumber and wood panel production in the United States. This kind of shows what that timber breakdown is that we harvest in the state. And the majority of what we harvest, over 50% of what we harvest is pine pulp wood. Uh, and I mixed with this, this graph shows pine and hardwood. The majority of that is pine uh, pulp wood that comes from that 52 or 3 percent there. Uh, the second highest is pine salt timber. So I'm going to kind of tell this story of what's happened over the past decade or so and kind of look at some indicators to pay attention to if you want to kind of see what happens and what's driving these market trends going forward. I'm not going to go through every single one of these product classes, but I'm going to really just kind of tell the story by looking at pulpwood and salt timber. And I'm going to do that by looking at overall trends based on timber mark south uh, pricing data. 
uh, and the way Timber Mart South does their uh, pricing data, they break it Alabama up into two regions, the northern region and the southern region, and that blue line across the state is the separation between the north and the south in the state based on those prices. And that's pretty much 85. If you took 85 and extended it past Montgomery straight on into Mississippi, that's pretty much, if you want to kind of think of where that line is, that's what you're looking at there. So on these figures that I'm going to show you, uh, what I'm showing you here is from 2007 through 2018. These are overall average prices in the state. I broke it down by North Alabama, South Alabama, and statewide average in the middle. Your South Alabama is the blue dotted line, North Alabama is the green dash line, and the overall state average is there, the solid dark line in the center. Okay? This is, the prices are going to be in dollars per ton, and this is Southern Pine Pulpwood, and it's from 2007 to 2018, and you can actually see from 2007, over the last decade or so, based on stumpage value, Pulpwood's actually increased slightly in the state, on average. And you can see the big difference between North Alabama and South Alabama in terms of prices, and that's largely driven because that's where our mills are in the South, that's where the markets are for it. There's not many markets up here, and that's why that price separation is the way it's at. Keep this in mind as we get back to when I start talking about economic indicators and what's going to happen, you know, things to look forward to in the future, and, and, and kind of relate that to what this has done in the past 10 years. One of the reasons this is, and when, and when you think of Pulpwood prices, you initially think that it's a poor market right now, but actually the demand's there, the demand's been there, we're just not seeing the price rebound. And a lot of this is, right here, is kind of these peaks right here, just lack of salt timber harvest, that pulpwood prices are kind of, pulpwood harvest are making up for that residual that's left over from salt timber harvest. But as we go forward, keep, kind of keep a reminder of what's happening here. And as I go through each of these, I'll talk about kind of what to look forward to uh, in the future, or look forward to going forward. So, Going forward, and, and a lot of this is just based on some economic indicators, I think the demand for pine pulpwood is going to increase slightly going forward for several reasons. Uh, we, we really haven't lost the demand for pulpwood in the state, uh, you know, in the past few years, uh, or even the past decade. Uh, what we are missing is no, no competition. We don't have the competition we do in other parts of the region for pine pulpwood. Uh, there's parts of you know southeast Georgia, northeast Florida that their markets are almost double as strong as ours in pulpwood. It's the demands there. It's just they have the mill competition. We don't right now. Um, and the reason I think the demand is going to continue to increase slightly for pulpwood is there's a strong paperboard and packaging market right now that's currently you know getting stronger by the year. Uh, it's expected to reach uh, almost a trillion dollar industry by 2020. A lot of the mills in the state are converting their pulpwood mills to handle paperboard and packaging. There's a lot of investments going into that. So I think the demand is going to be there. One thing with pine pulpwood where I'm not sure we're going to see, at least initially, we're going to see any price jumps is because demand for salt timber is increasing uh, quite significantly. So when that happens, you typically have a negative effect on your pulpwood prices because of those residuals. So I'm not necessarily saying the pulpwood prices are going to increase by any means. What I'm saying is I think the demand is going to still be there. I think the prices are going to be kind of hampered by the increased harvest of salt in going forward. We do have a strong global market. We've got to look for how our dollar affects that though and affects those exports in the future. That's going to be key. We do have a strong pulp and paper market in the southeast as a whole. The only reason we're a little different than some of the other states like Georgia and Florida and some of their stronger markets is simply a result of the competition we have here in the state for that pulp. This shows hardwood pulpwood over the last decade. The figures are the same in terms of north, south, and statewide average. We've seen this significantly increase. I think this is a, about a, yeah, it's, almost, it's over double what the price was on average uh, 10 years ago or so. 
But a lot of this is a result of we just haven't been harvesting trees over the last 10 years. A lot of that demand has come back for that. But I don't, I'm not real optimistic optimistic about uh, hardwood pulp wood going forward. There's just not that much of a need. Uh, the demand's increasing for pine pulp wood over hardwood pulp wood right now. Uh, we're not using news press and writing paper as much anymore, which that had a big role in the hardwood pulp wood market. Uh, so right now I think it's a matter of just the lack of harvest in general has driven that up with still a need. But I don't see long term, I'm not that optimistic that it's going to remain that high. This is pine saw timber. You can see where the housing market crash hit. Right here, they basically plummeted and then it's kind of flattened out over the last, you know, you're looking at eight, nine years there where not a lot of change has happened. You're looking at upwards of averages that are up in the high 30s, low 40s 10 years ago to averages that are in the low to mid 20s right now. Why haven't we seen this increase is basically a result of we have too much supply which has a negative impact on the demand. Demand's increasing. We've har increased salt timber harvest in the state by over 30% over the last five years. It's there, the demand's back, the housing market's back, but we just have so much on the ground that it's keeping those prices down right now until we catch up. Combination of that and not having the market. The mills that are there, they're happy. They got all the wood they need. They don't have to fight for it right now. So until that changes, you know, this is gonna be kind of a slow process. I don't know when or if we'll ever get back to this type of market, but I do, I am optimistic that this is going to improve. It's just a matter of how fast. So we have, with salt timber, we all know housing market, the economy are big factors. When those are going good, harvests usually increase. We do have more mills that are reopening in the state. We have more mills that are moving into the state that are going to be uh, affecting that supply. Uh, but the problem right now, we haven't seen that initial rebound or it happening that fast is because of that reason right there. That's that surplus of timber and that lack of mill competition. Hardwood salt timber, and I'm just I'm just gonna use this hard this is mixed hardwood as an example uh, across the state. This isn't uh, we also track this for oak salt timber as well, but they're pretty similar. If you could put the figures on top of each other, they'd be pretty much the same trends. Oak salt timber have a little higher prices. The only difference. Um, you can see early uh, in the early part of the decade, you know, we had variable kind of markets for hardwood and salt timber, which is pretty common. And then about 2012, 2013, up through 2015, it skyrocketed. And a lot of that has to do with exports. Uh, 2014, 2015 were record years for hardwood and salt timber exports in the state of Alabama. Most of the time when the market's good, you'll start to see that separation between North and South Alabama in terms of prices, and that's primarily driven by where the hardwood's located in the state. Uh, another thing to point out is it's not representative on this figure, but uh, for oak salt timber, Brown Foreman, the, the mill up in uh, the northeast part of the state, they produce the white oak whiskey barrels for Jack Daniels. They are harvesting a lot of oak salt timber. White oak salt timber is what they use for that. I've heard of them hauling and buying logs south of Lee County and taking it up that far north. So they're, they're really in need of white oak salt timber right now. That's why there's a lot of the reason why the prices are driven, along with the need for exports, yeah, along with the housing market as well. One thing to keep an eye on though, with the hardwood markets in the future, a big role of that is not only the domestic economy and the increase in housing market and how that plays out in the future, but exports and what happens politically between countries like China, most of our hardwood exports go to China, I think upwards of 70%, 75%. So how that plays a role is gonna really kind of trickle down to long-term uh, effects on what the hardwood market's gonna do here. We do have an increased demand for pallets and railroad tire materials, which is good, it's going to help keep that up there, but the bigger factors are your exports and your housing market and the economy. 
and then local demands for wood like that. So if you want to break down what affects stumpage price, uh, you really can break it down into two scales. You have a large scale and a local scale. Local scale, I'm thinking as a landowner individually or you know, a smaller community. Large scale, you're looking at you know, kind of what's driving the overall trends. Uh, you have the economy, obviously, at the large scale, the housing market, demand for products at a, you know, different levels, whether it's local, national, or global. Uh, the supply of timber is a big one, and then I put seasonality there because seasonality can affect the large scale as well as the local scale. You know, individual landowners can be impacted by dry weather, wet weather, as well as a whole region that can be affected. So those two things drive prices along with your distance to the mill. Obviously is a big one for individual landowners. Competition, what I say there is not landowner competition. But what, what's your mill, what's your market conditions in the area where you're at? Is there a lot of opportunities for you to sell lumber? Are the mills close? Are there a lot of mills fighting for wood? All those things are going to have an impact on what your individual stumpage price is going to be. The demand for uh, timber, obviously the mill inventory, and then, you know, kind of two, go back here, kind of two, uh, more obvious ones are track size and tree species, wood quality, and how much lumber you have are going to help with those stumpage prices. But I highlighted competition, housing market, and supply of timber because when you boil it down in the state of Alabama right now, those are the three things that are going to be the major players that are major players now in what's happening with the timber market and are going to be the things you need to keep an eye on going forward and, and how this thing turns around. Mill to mill competition. Oversupply of timber, how are we going to take care of that? How is this going to react? And then how long is the housing market going to stay the way it is? And I'm going to touch on the housing market next to kind of put that in perspective. So as a landowner, that's what I would pay attention. I pay attention to what housing market does, what the trends are, and what they, the outlook is in the future. I pay attention to kind of what overall average trends are in terms of supply in the state and then what, mill, what the mills are doing. The housing market right now, we've been, you know, at historically low interest rates, which is always good for the economy and the housing market. Uh, just turning the year, turning into 2019 in January, we actually approached close to 5% interest rate. So it was increasing. It's since dropped a little bit. They're between 4 and 4.2 and 4.7%. I'm like, you know, likely to see that kind of creep up again as the year gets older. Uh, housing affordability remains very good, which is a good thing. Job creation is improving, but how that's going to affect and relate to the housing market is going to depend on what kind of jobs are improving. What kind of jobs are being created has a bigger role in that. And then changing attitudes towards single family ownership. We are seeing a trend getting away from single family homes and they're kind of going back to starter homes, which typically is an indicator of a slowdown in the housing market. but. Builders are starting to know this, so they're changing their focus as well and starting to build more of those the starter homes and getting away from those single family style homes. So, long story short, the housing market is still good. I think in the long run, at least through 2019, it's going to still be improving, but it's going to slow down. It's going to be more of a slow, steady growth instead of what it's been operating at over the last few years. Uh, and just to update on mills in Alabama, we are we do have mills coming in. Like I mentioned, the reopening uh, mills that were there in the past that have been idle. Uh, Rex Lumber Company in Pike County, they invested 110 million dollars in a mill that's going to produce uh, a minimum of 240 million board feet a year, around 600 loads a week. International Paper, their dump. Uh, their total investment now is over $500 million in the mill of Riverdale to go towards paperboard and packaging. That's what their focus is going to be. Georgia Pacific is doing the same thing. They're investing $50 million upgrade in Bruton on paperboard and packaging. Their total investment is over $400 million in that mill. They're also opening a $100 million lumber facility in Talladega. Westerbelt Mill in Clark County 
250 million board feet capacity that are expected to start operating in early 2020. And then we have International Beams, which is newly uh, operating. It, it, it's just now become operational in Dothan, Alabama. They're going to produce what's called cross-laminated timber, which is where they build mass timber products out of dimensional lumber. Um, initially, they're not going to harvest round wood, though. They're going to use cut wood, uh, dimensional lumber, to build that initially. But once they, you know, talking with them, once they kind of get the process down and they get the kinks out, they will, they plan on harvesting round wood from the state of Alabama. So those are all things that are good uh, impacts to the state and the forest industry going forward. So just in summary, uh, we do have a strong timber industry. Uh, I think that's, you know, I don't see signs of it slowing down, really. Um, I think it's going to remain strong. Demand's increasing for different timber products in the state. Uh, housing market's likely to slow a little bit, though, to more of a slow, steady growth stage. And then the biggest thing right now that's keeping us back is surplus of timber and lack of mill competition that's on the ground right now. That's really the reason the uh, stumping prices are the way they are. I do want to kind of point out to our first speaker uh, when they talk about, you know, focus on smaller landowners. I think going forward, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, there's no right answer whether you should refer everything to hardwood, whether you should keep doing pine. I think for smaller landowners, larger landowners, I think you got to keep doing what you're doing. Smaller landowners, I think it's all about diversification. I think you need to focus on what's right for your site, what markets do you have in your area. Markets do come and go, so I think you need to give yourself options. You know, I think you need to think beyond the timber line, especially if you have smaller tracts of land. Think about making and generating income that can accompany that timber harvest and kind of be in between those long-term rotations as well. Um, so diversification, when you're thinking about your forest management, give yourself options and your planning and what you can get based on what's local, what's in your market, what markets are in your area, and what your forest can produce. Thank you.